Testing. Everybody ready? Ready when you are, Rigo. We're live. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our K-3 Reopening of Schools online question and answer forum. This is our first time trying this format, so I'm going to borrow an invocation from our board president. Please forgive any technical glitches that may come up. I'm Ed Peterson, Director of Communications for Othello School District. With us this evening are our superintendent, Dr. Chris Hurst, and our assistant superintendent of teaching and learning, Pete Perez. Our elementary school principals and uh, directors from our district office are with us as well. If you have questions, you can submit them as comments on our Facebook live video stream. If you don't have a Facebook account, you can go to othelloschools.org and use the form that we've supplied there. It's a Google form. You can just type in your question and we will see that pop up. We can't promise that we'll have time to get to every question. We're gonna do our best. Uh, earlier in this week, we invited parents and community members to submit questions in advance through our website. So we will go through those questions now before we uh, continue on to questions that are coming in online. So the first question here is for board president, Mike Garza. Uh, Mike, how did the board come to this decision to reopen schools? All right, well, good. First of all, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, as we all know, it's always been the district's plan to, to get our kids back to school. Uh, we just wanted to do it, or they want to do it in, in the safest way possible. Um, we, the board, started hearing from a lot of our constituents, uh, some of our employees, on the need to get our kids back. Um, our COVID numbers started going down. Um, the board started having the conversation. Um, a vote was taken and the board decided to tell the district to get a plan together for a reopening. Um, and, and kudos to the, to, the, to the district staff who had arduously worked throughout the summer to put a plan to get together. Um, and what they did is they, they added a few components to that plan, uh, adjusted it, um, and here we are today. Uh, we're, we're eager, waiting, uh, trying to get every, everything uh, put in place to, to reopen on the 4th. Uh, but we got there because of uh, constituents and some employees uh, seeing the need to get the kids back. And the district has always been in favor and in wanting our kids back. So uh, a combination of things. Um, thankfully, our, our numbers are way down and we are very optimistic that they'll continue to go down. So uh, that's what's got us here today. Thank you, and we'll keep going right along with the questions here. Uh, Mr. Perez, what will happen if a student or students uh, receives a positive COVID diagnosis? If a student has a confirmed diagnosis, they will be quarantined until they are no longer contagious. All students and staff who had close contact with that particular student uh, would be notified. 
And it's also important to note that if two or two or more students in a particular cohort are diagnosed, then that entire cohort or group of students will be quarantined for two weeks. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, Sandra V, will students be required to wear masks? Yes, all students uh, and staff will be required to wear masks. Um, they may have an alternate face covering that is approved through the local Department of Health for valid health reasons. Thank you. Uh, our superintendent, Dr. Hurst, what will happen if a student refuses to wear a mask or their parent refuses to enforce masking rules? Thanks for the question, Ed. First, I'd like to just share that this is a Department of Health requirement. Students who refuse to wear an appropriate face covering will not be able to remain in class. And Mr. Perez, back to you for this one. Actually, the next two are yours. Will parents have a choice on whether their child goes back face to face or not? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we are offering an online only plan for families who are not ready or comfortable sending their children back to school. Uh, it will not be the same as the current online model, but that option to, to stay in a remote setting is available. And then the next one was marked for you as well. If we start off in the blended model, if a parent starts their family off in the blended model, um, can they decide to move them back online later if they decide that it's not working out for them? Excellent question. Uh, a frequent transition is not is not a conducive to good educational results. It's not the kind of system we want to yo-yo back and forth between an, a remote setting and a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, our primary goal is to have children in our classrooms uh, where we can serve them best. And once a child is in a blended model, uh, they can't switch back to online learning unless they are quarantined or we have an outbreak that forces everyone back to the online model. We have built in uh, particular gaps or breaks when we are going to bring more students on campus. Uh, and at those natural breaks, we would uh, consult with families who have considered, who have made the choice to stay online. And that might be an appropriate time where they could jump into uh, the on-campus face-to-face instruction. So there will be some movement back and forth at those natural breaks. Thank you. Uh, question for uh, Deborah Boudouin, our principal at Scutiny. Uh, will kids get to participate in recess? Um, yes, kids will get to participate in recess. There are still um, guidelines around making sure that they're able to do that safely, like maintaining that six feet of distance and um, wearing masks if they're going to be within that six feet. But yes, they'll get to participate in recess. Thank you. And back to our director of human resources, Sandra. Will temperature checks be taken at the schools? And if so, where? Uh, at the school upon entering or on the school bus or somewhere else? Uh, well, parents will be expected to submit a daily screening for their child or students that are going to school daily uh, for that school day. So there will be limited cases where we will need to temp check and screen students. So we are equipped to do that. Uh, universal screenings at schools are not recommended by the CDC due to a high percentage of asymptomatic cases. Um, but we will be equipped to, to take temperatures if we need to. Uh, Mary, and our Director of Transportation, how will you determine or how will we determine what kids are in each group, morning or afternoon? They will be divided by the geographical uh, area where they um, live. So children living inside the city limits will be in our AM session and students outside of the city limits will be in the PM session with transportation provided. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hurst, how can you safely guarantee, uh, how can you guarantee the safety of kids from getting sick and bringing it home to parents that have pre-existing conditions? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we cannot provide that type of guarantee. Um, we are doing everything possible to ensure that we're practicing uh, health and safety guidelines and making sure that our um, practices as far as cleaning and disinfecting is maintained as well. But we also want to share that we're offering an online uh, option available for our families who have some health or some safety concerns that may prevent them from sending their kids back to school. I will share that the, uh, the online version that we would be offering would not be the same that we're doing right now. 
but unfortunately we cannot offer that type of guarantee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perez, uh, could you give us some insight on what the daily sanitization process will look like in schools? Will classrooms be cleaned or sanitized between the morning and afternoon groups? Absolutely. Custodial staff will continue with their normal uh, daily cleaning routines and sanitizing processes. Uh, they've been doing that even before the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. And they'll help with any other duties wherever possible. But certainly it's, uh, it's a big lift for one or two custodians at each individual school site. Their current normal daily duties and, and areas that they sanitize include activities like vacuuming, sweeping and mopping, certainly the removal of, of garbage and cleaning restrooms and sinks and, and high touch areas such as doors and windows and uh, door handles on our campuses. Uh, they also will spend time in staff rooms, work rooms and lunch rooms where people might be passing through, uh, but certainly we're not at a point where we would be gathering in groups in those areas. Now, uh, in addition to our, our folks at custodians who uh, generally work in those areas, it, this is going to require uh, support from all adults in our, on our campuses. So teachers, paras, other folks who um, who work in our schools day to day will be responsible to help with cleaning up some of the general student areas. So the student workstations, student desks, student chairs, classroom tables and whatnot. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity for us to uh, remind our students about personal responsibility, personal health, hand washing, all those kinds of things. Now, Now, classrooms will be cleaned once a day. But the sanitizing of those areas will be done frequently throughout the day. And we'll have products on hand and tools for um, uh, our students and our staff to use in a safe manner. And cleaning and sanitizing are two very different things and should not be characterized as the same. But we'll be using those processes um, throughout the day in a consistent way to keep everyone safe as possible. Thanks. And we're going through questions that were submitted earlier in the week through an online form on our website before we get to questions that are coming in over Facebook and, and still folks sending in questions via the website form as well. Um, Dr. I'm sorry, Mr. Perez, you alluded, or I think Dr. Hurst alluded to this earlier, um, but will kids have the opportunity to continue with their Zoom meetings like they're doing right now if they're not ready to come back into the, the classroom? Yeah, unfortunately, the current online model um, will most likely not be an option. Uh, we're, we certainly want to hear from families who decide to come back, but we're our focus now, because we believe it's safe to bring students back, is to uh, use our manpower in the face-to-face um, -face model. Uh, so that means a slight adjustment to what's happening uh, online. So students who opt out of returning in, in the blended model, they'll continue with an online experience through a learning management system. And there'll be a series of tools or um, resources that live online that our staff will help manage. And there will be interactions between the students and teachers, but it will not be the live synchronous Zoom sessions that we've been running. Okay, Will, our principal at Hiawatha uh, question is, do I have to send my children to school? Yeah, that's a great question. So by laws, children over eight, um, are required to attend school. However, um, as has been stated before, because of various, if you have a, a pre-existing condition or some, some reason that you um, are not ready to take your, let your child go back to school in person, we are offering that, that online, fully online option as well. Um, as uh, Mr. Perez has said, that option will be very different than what we're currently offering, but we we do feel like it'll be a viable option for our students that feel like remaining on an online um, setting, but we do, students over the age of eight are required to be in, enrolled in some form of schooling. Thank you. And so with the blended model, we'll have AM, PM groups. Uh, kids will be in the classroom less than they normally would in a traditional model. Uh, Pete, could you give us some information on whether or not students who are, st are coming back into the classroom will still have online work to do? Sure. So those students or families that choose the face-to-face -face instruction should still expect that about 50% of their learning or their experiences will be online at home. Uh, certainly that face-to-face uh, -face contact and interaction and intervention from our, our highly qualified staff is an important change. And, and as stated earlier by, um, I believe, uh, uh, School Board President Garza, that's the preferred model. Uh, we know that that's what serves our students best. Uh, and 
to get kids back in a safe way and to maintain social distancing, it's going to require at the time that they're not there full time. So certainly some of their time will be spent in our learning management system as well. Um, working on fluency and other activities that support what's happening in the face-to-face -face instruction. And Pete, what are some of the details of that uh, learning management system? How will that work? Well, much of it is self-directed. Um, so we're going to make sure that we do a good job of training up the students. Many of the systems and resources they're already familiar with. Uh, there are programs that you may have heard at home for our, our parents that are listening. Uh, Moby Max, Imagine Learning, Freckles, Zern. Uh, these are many platforms that the district has had around for uh, a number of years. And our, our students are familiar with them. Uh, certainly, the district has, has uh, worked very hard to get internet access available to all of our students. Uh, so the infrastructure is there. We have the resources. Uh, but it will be, uh, uh, like I stated, the important thing to remember is it is a self-directed model, particularly the online model, the full online model. Uh, the blended model will include those components, but you'll have that daily interaction uh, in the AM or PM with the classroom teacher to, to provide guidance and direction and monitor progress for kids who do the blended stuff offsite. Thank you. Dr. Hurst, uh, what is our plan if there's a COVID outbreak identified in a school building? Of course, I think I first like to share that this is why we recommended to the board a phased in approach by different grade levels, because what it does is it allows us to bring in a certain grade level and then just monitor to see what's happening with that grade level, looking for potential outbreaks, any activity before we bring another grade level on board. But to answer your question, if there is widespread outbreak, um, if we have to close down the school, then that school will temporarily close down. We will quarantine the students and the staff, and they'll be operating on an online Zoom model, just like we're doing right now during that time. Thank you. Um, board President Garza, Will volunteers be allowed to work in their students' classrooms? Uh, volunteers are a huge asset and we love having them in school. Uh, but at this time, uh, again, we're all gonna experience some change. Uh, they will not be allowed to be in school. I mean, we, we need to try to keep down the number of people that are in the building. Um, if we're gonna, well, we're not if we are, we're gonna uh, social distance requirements uh, for, for purposes of social distancing and, and the square footage needed, we need to minimize the amount of people in the building. So uh, as of right now, no, as much as we would like, volunteers will, will not be accepted at the school sites. Thank you. And I know we are looking forward to bringing volunteers back as soon as we can, because they are absolutely, part absolutely. Of what we do. Uh, Marion, transportation, will we still be using bus routes to deliver meals to students who aren't coming back yet, those fourth through sixth grade middle and high school students? There will be changes to our meal distribution plan. Um, meals will still be available to the students um, that opt out of returning to school or to the classroom. However, uh, school pickup locations will be um, changed as well the bus distribution. We'll have more information on available on the website this week. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hurst, when looking at health rates for families of a fellow as part of the decision to return, uh, the question is, are the metrics including uh, rural Grant County, uh, rural areas in Grant County, Adams County and Lincoln County, or is it simply all of Adams County? Yeah, of course. Um, just to answer your question, uh, quite frankly, it's all of Adams County. The Department of Health does not track the data by uh, district boundaries um, or city limits. It's all of Ad Adams County. And I think it, this may be a good time also to share with uh, the public um, the diagram that you have, if you could bring that. And then I can uh, share that with the public as well. I can. Talia, can you make me a host, please, so I can share that chart? There we go. 
So as I was sharing, um, Department of Health only captures data by Adams County, so the entire Adams County. Uh, I think one of the things that we've been doing is just sharing this information with our board of directors and all of our leaders. And I think some of our members have access to this data as well. Um, what you can see is um, looking at September 21st, uh, you can see that we were as a county at a high of 635.2 cases. Uh, that's positive COVID cases per 100,000. And you can see a, a steady decline over um, the days and leading up to now, um, as of yesterday, October the 14th, um, the positive COVID rate per 100,000 for Adams County is 183 uh, thereabouts. So um, a drastic reduction in the number of positive COVID cases. So that's just um, really a shout out to the community for um, doing all that they can do and masking and staying safe. So we've come a long way as a community. But to answer your question, it's just the county. Thank you. Uh, Mary, and another question for transportation. Will there be changes in how transportation runs with the blended model? Um, PM students in the rural areas will still have uh, student transportation. Um, masks will be required. We have some um, requirements that we have to follow, but we will be allowed to fill our buses to capacity and um, we'll be asking for windows to be rolled down as needed and weather providing, permitting that we can, that it's not too cold. Families will be able to sit together, we'll social distance as much as we can. All right, thank you. That uh, takes care of questions that came in throughout the week on the forum on our website. We do have some that have come in on the Facebook uh, live stream and a couple more on the forum so far. So uh, this seems like a really important question that I actually uh, have heard a lot of and either Dr. Hurst or Pete Perez if you could shed some light on it. Um, the question is, why are we starting with elementary going back first instead of the middle or senior high schoolers? Yeah, I can uh, start off first and then uh, Pete can jump in. I think one of the things that I, I shared, um, one, we have a phase in approach just so that we can watch and just be very cautious. We wanted to start with K through three, um, really because as you look at the high school and the middle school, the cohorting is uh, more difficult. So when you think about elementary, um, it's easy to keep those students in place in one setting without them moving around a lot. It's just much more difficult at the middle and high school. So it just really makes sense for us to start with the elementary grades first, the primary grades, and really starting in that phase approach, like I said before, K through three and then four through six. The K through three just allows us to watch that segment first and looking at COVID activity, making sure we have everything in place and then bringing in that next group. Did I leave, leave anything out, Pete? Yeah, certainly the, the cohorting is an important factor that is an additional challenge at the secondary schools. The one piece I would add for the elementary folks, um, we, we've been uh, encouraged by the Department of Health when we bring students back to really consider those that are, are struggling the most and what we're hearing from our teachers and from our families is uh, when you think about age appropriateness of a, of a remote learning platform, our, our, our youngest students are really, really struggling. Uh, so that's a, a compounding factor or a rationale for saying, let, let's start with the, the youngest folks who are really struggling, learn some lessons, build some systems, and then move forward um, in a phased approach. But the challenge at the secondary level, it's not just in Othello, even some of the communities around us who are are open, uh, they continue to be in a remote setting for their secondary students. Thanks guys. Uh, Marion, you might be able to help with this one. Uh, right before this meeting started, you sent me a document that had some start and end times for the morning and afternoon groups at each of the elementary schools. And so we have a question here is, um, what time will schools start and end? Can you help with that one? So we'll be having staggered uh, start times just to, so our buses can accommodate getting the students to each building on time. 
Um, morning classes will begin at 7.50 at Hiawatha, um, 7.55 at Ludicaga, 8 o'clock at Scutney, and 8.10 at Wahidas. And then our PM start times are 11.30 at Hiawatha, 11.40 at Ludicaga, 11.50 at Scutney, and 11.40 at Wahidas. Thank you. Uh, another question about recess, which is my personal favorite subject, uh, with a lot of kids on playgrounds um, running around doing recess things, will we be keeping things like slides and swings open? If we are, how will we be ensuring that they're not uh, conduits for virus spreading? Um, Keith, can you help with that one? Yes, I, I think it's going to be uh, the reminders that we're going to need to give our students consistently about wearing your mask maintaining proper social distancing and washing your hands. Those are going to con can you continue to be our, our strongest um, um, methods for, for preventing the spread of the virus. Now, if we have high touch areas like we do with door handles and other items in, in classrooms, we're certainly going to clean those frequently. So if we identify areas on the playground that students are able to access, they're able to use them safely uh, in a socially distant appropriate way, then we'll, we want, would want to allow them to use them and we'd want to be mindful of cleaning those high touch areas. Uh, so I, I think the, at the heart of this question is, uh, it's gonna be different for our kids. School is going to feel different. It's not going to be normal. And, uh, but we're excited to have them back and we want to keep them as safe as possible. So I, I think if our attitude is that we're, we're very uh, upfront with them about those primary rules of wearing a mask, staying six feet apart and washing their hands, and when they, they, uh, are, what I have learned about kids, particularly in elementary schools, uh, they learn the rules of the game. They learn how to walk down the hall. They learn how to treat each other. And I'm fully confident that uh, our teachers and our kids are going to come back and, and get it right. Uh, but yeah, we'll try and, and give them a, an opportunity to experience recess. And uh, it was one of um, uh, the most enjoyable parts of my elementary experience. So we'll make it work for them. Great, thank you. Uh, another question about, actually about preschool. I don't know if we have Jennifer Garza with us tonight, um, but if anybody has some insight, what is the plan for preschool? When will they come back? Yeah, we had initially, uh, our interest was in bringing the preschool students back at the same time we did uh, our, our K-3 students. Uh, there is one additional factor and that's the, the installation and setup of the portables. So uh, they've done a great job uh, working through the, there were some delays related to um, uh, factory being shut down uh, that was building uh, the, the new portables, but they're on site, things are, are coming together. Um, so our intention is, I believe when we bring on our, our four through six students towards the end of November, that we'll be in a better position to consider bringing back our pre-K kids. But the delay for them was strictly related to the facility uh, not being available or ready for them. Thanks. And I'm actually touring the, the new facility site with Jen uh, tomorrow morning. So we're going to have some exciting shares coming soon about preschool in that new spot for them. Um, will students go to school Monday through Friday? I believe, yes, in the blended model, they will be on site Monday through Friday, correct? Okay. Uh, will the district provide enough cleaning and sanitizing materials for teachers who see multiple classes per day, like elementary specialists, et cetera? Sandra, could you shed some light on that one? Yeah, we've been uh, we've been gearing up for our, our clean supplies uh, as soon as we were able to early summer. So we feel pretty comfortable with the supplies we have on hand, um, and our staff and students will be well equipped to disinfect uh, high touch areas and and sanitize the areas that need to be sanitized. Thank you. Uh, will teachers have plexiglass or any other kind of screen other than masks? Uh, plexiglass is not a requirement of the CDC, um, and so we are adhering to those CDC and Department of Health requirements. Uh, right now, it's the mask requirements and the social distancing. Um, we do have plexiglass for our um, special education students um, and, that, and those staff in, in those departments. Thank you. A uh, question about number of students in a classroom. How many will we have in a classroom at one time in each cohort group? The primary factor for determining class size will be uh, square footage and, and the appropriate amount of students that we can 
place in a classroom while maintaining uh, six feet of social distance at a minimum. So that will be, that will, it'll just be a simple math problem. How well, the square footage available, how many kids can we fit in there? Uh, what, what our teachers and our families should expect, at least in the K-3 model, is it's going to be between uh, eight and 12 students. Uh, that would be the maximum number of students that would be in a classroom at any particular time. Thank you. And that's uh, obviously we're splitting classes between AM and PM that would normally be together, correct? Uh, late start Mondays, are those still going to be something that we do in the blended model? A late start Monday. So the, this, for the student experience, no, they, they will be coming to school on Mondays at a regular time. Uh, so if it's asked from a student and a family perspective, uh, if that's what the question is, then they should, um, they should expect that Mondays will feel like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have Jeanette Root, our Director of Dining Services with us tonight. Uh, Sandra, could you maybe help with this one? Uh, breakfast and lunch service. Uh, will students eat in the classrooms? Will they eat in the cafeteria? Uh, how will that work? Yeah, so the AM and, and PM students um, will get meals. So the way we uh, will have it um, operating is our AM students will check in. They will get into their classrooms, uh, take attendance, and then they will be walked to uh, the dining service to pick up their breakfast. It will be a warm breakfast and they will eat in their classrooms. And then before they exit um, the school for the day and head home, they will pick up a uh, lunch bag uh, for, for their lunch. And then the PM students uh, will check into the classroom, um, take attendance, and then they will go get a warm lunch. And then before they head out for the day, they will grab a sack breakfast for the next morning. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a shot at this one. When do kids get to go back to school? So our kindergarten through third graders, they start on November 4th. Uh, fourth through sixth grade, they're slated to start on November 30th. And then our uh, seventh graders, I believe, start as uh, seventh through high school start in January uh, with eighth and eighth through 12th graders coming back on January 25th. If that is not correct, somebody fix that for me. Okay, we have one come in on the Facebook page. Uh, are we still going to have reading groups? And if so, how will they be kept six feet apart? Uh, Jen Perez, do you want to try to take that one? Um, we will be servicing students in reading, but reading groups themselves will look different. So we will maintain wearing our masks and staying six feet apart. Currently, our teachers are planning how to utilize best utilize paraprofessionals to still deliver um, intervention services to our students for reading and math. We're also working on what small groups look like for any of our special education services might need more services um, in reading and math. So it will look different as we've said, but our goal is absolutely to continue meeting the student needs as best we can while maintaining our social distancing. Okay, uh, Pete or Dr. Hurst or, or both, uh, the next question on the Facebook page kind of uh, can be looked at through the guise of mask breaks. Uh, a comment that uh, the student will have a hard time keeping a mask on for more than an hour at a time. So will students get an opportunity during the school day to, to take their masks off and, and breathe a little bit? Is there anything built in for them to be able to do that? I'll let you go ahead, Pete. Yeah, I, I have worked pretty closely with the principals and, and uh, quite frankly, we haven't built in any mask breaks, but I know what our, what our uh, teachers are really good at is monitoring how students are feeling, the level of engagement. Um, they get a good sense of what's happening in the room. So what we're asking our folks to do is, is to, to think a little bit differently. So perhaps they would embed opportunities that uh, now it's common in schools. You hear things like brain breaks. Let's take a little break. Let's, let's catch our breath, so to speak. Uh, but we would want to do that in a safe way. So is there a way we can go outside? Can we go outside for just a moment, take a break from the mask, come back in? But the expectation is from a safety perspective that they would keep the mask on uh, while they're on campus around other folks inside. Um, 
And if someone has a significant breathing issue, then that's a factor that Department of Health and their medical provider would, would help us think through. Uh, so I'm, I'm fully confident that teachers are going to uh, pay attention to that, be aware of it. And I imagine come up with some really good ideas about how to how to give students a break and, and make them feel comfortable. I do. Uh, related to that, I want to step back to the question about the reading groups and those sorts of interventions that felt a little bit like a staff question. Uh, so what I've been trying to remind folks is we're, we're coming back to school and folks feel like, well, I know how it feels when I've been here. It's only going to be half the kids. So their groups are going to be very, very small. They're going to be they're going to be different than they were before. Uh, so just just remember that it's easy to forget. I, I do it all the time thinking it's going to be it's going to be uh, crowded like a typical school day. But um, just keep that in mind that we're going to be about 50 uh, percent capacity in, in those groups. Thank you. Uh, great question as we're starting to head into cooler weather. Um, what happens if there's a two hour late start due to weather uh, and we have to have a delayed start? Will our, our morning kids still come to school that day or will they stay home and our afternoon kids come to school that day? How's that gonna work? Yeah, I would, I guess in, in uh, uh, my thinking around that, uh, it's the reason I think tied to the PLC question a little bit earlier, the late start Mondays, you know, we, it didn't make sense to us to have an hour and a half time break and bring kids in. So, uh, you know, uh, I would certainly would want to sit down with Dr. Hurst and, and with Marion and think through this just a, a little bit more. But my uh, my initial reaction is we would probably cancel that uh, AM section, uh, provide some asynchronous activities or some some work that they could do uh, at, at home. And we're going to encourage many of our families to keep the Chromebooks at home and to maintain that access uh, to our technology. But I guess just throwing it out there, Marin, we probably would cancel the, the AM sessions. Pete, can I add something there? That just let everybody know that also went into our decision to have um, our town kids um, yeah. and our non-transportation students come in the morning as our buses a lot of times have to get out really early and it doesn't give as much time to thaw in the day. So we're, we're hopeful that we're able to buy a little bit of time having those um, in-town kids or the non-transportation kids um, coming to school first and that we hopefully will have fewer uh, late starts than when we have to send those buses out so early in the morning. Thanks, Will. Uh, Marion, did you have anything else to add on that? No? Okay. Um, question about kind of monitoring students and, and Pete, you, you mentioned earlier that teachers are really good at monitoring students and, and how they're doing today. Um, how will we handle students that end up uh, sick at school, maybe they filled out the, the wellness form, they weren't showing any symptoms when they got on the bus in the morning uh, or came to school in the morning, but then during the day they developed a cough or some other symptom. How do we handle cases like that? Yeah, there's some very specific guidance from the Department of Health around what are uh, have been titled isolation rooms. So each school principal has been charged with identifying a particular space in their, in their school that would be used uh, to, to find a space to safely monitor those students. In most instances, it would be our um, trained uh, medical staff. So we have a couple RNs on staff that are highly trained. And we also have some nurse assistants that manage the day-to-day -day activities at our elementary schools. Uh, we're gonna find a space for those uh, students. We're gonna get emergency contact immediately and let families know that um, those rooms would be for suspected COVID cases if we think it's that. If a kid has uh, another sort of uh, common school illness or, or we don't believe that it's COVID, there's no reason for us to believe that. We're still going to continue to use our, our school um, nurse office and for those uh, general activities. But there would be an isolation room where the student would be escorted to. Um, the student would be required to wear a mask. The adults that interact with that student would be required to have a PPE um, certainly to protect themselves. So we would close the doors, make sure that it's, it's ventilated and safe for the student, but we're going to need some support from our families. And those emergency contacts are very, very important. So we can get a hold of folks and they can come pick their child up so that we can uh, have them assessed and determine whether or not it is, it is a, indeed a, a COVID case. Thanks. Uh, another question about screening staff and students. Will all the students and staff be screened prior to entering the buildings? And we, uh, handled that earlier, but staff will have to fill out the same kind of daily wellness form that students and parents will have to fill out every day, attesting that 
they're not exhibiting any symptoms. They haven't come into contact with anybody that is uh, expected or suspected of, of being COVID positive. Uh, but the CDC does not recommend universal screening of students as they're entering school buildings. Uh, will we be providing disposable masks to students? Uh, Sandra, is that something you can opine on? Um, so we do have a supply of masks and um, we have been getting donations thanks to CBHA who supplied us with a, um, a pretty substantial amount of masks for our students. Um, so we do have masks on site. Um, each family will um, need to provide a mask for their child, but we are prepared to provide masks to students who do not have a mask. Thanks. Um, principals, Pete, Dr. Hurst, I know it's kind of hard to give an example of what a typical student day will look like at each grade level. It's gonna vary uh, a lot between classes and schools. But the question here is, uh, what will a typical day like be for each grade? Uh, what will the homework load be after school? So I know we talked a little earlier about how there would be asynchronous uh, resources available to students to help complement and supplement what they learn in person. But is there any more information you can share on that? Uh, Jen or Will, would you like to start that, Deborah? Sure. Um, our typical student day, it's going to be half of the time, of course. Um, they're going to come into their classroom, have breakfast. We started with breakfast after the bell last year, so that will feel a little bit similar to our students. Um, they will um, participate in specials. Um, it will be a shorter period of time, but I know our students are going to be very excited to have some in-person time with those folks as well. Um, you know, they're going to participate in core instruction for math and reading. Um, we'll do our best to integrate things so that we can include science and social studies content um, and then have small groups or one-on-one -on -one groups um, with our paraprofessionals and teachers to help intervene um, as students need it. Um, I don't know if Will or Deborah wants to continue on with some other components. Yeah, I think just building off or really agreeing and saying the same thing as Jen said, we're, we really worked hard and we've been collaborating a lot as buildings to really recreate that experience and make sure that what, what the, we've been successful with in the past is recreated in the best and safest way. So um, your students will continue as Jen described earlier to have um, focused um, interventions um, at their level. They just won't travel from classroom cl to classroom to get that. But as uh, Mr. Perez indicated earlier with the smaller class sizes, we feel that'll be really, um, a really similar experience to them. Um, specials, as Jen said, it will be coming in, um, but uh, safety precautions will be taken. For example, I'm sure PE will have to um, be mindful of what equipment they use and make sure that's sanitized afterwards. Um, there won't be singing and music, unfortunately, but they'll still be able to study and enjoy music and, and do those music appreciation things. So we really have full components um, in that, um, just condensed, as was said earlier. Um, and then we really do want to make sure parents know that school extends when, when students go home as well. So um, they will still have some online resources, though they won't be the same as they're getting right now with the Zoom sessions. Um, teachers will be able to support their students in, in accessing um, some of those asynchronous activities that students will be able to go and engage in and, and continue to supplement their education in that other half of the day when they're at home. So. Deborah, do you have anything else to add to that? No, just that um, these online activities that they would be doing at home, that in a typical day, these are things that students would be doing in the classroom. They would probably have time for fact fluency or um, some vocabulary work or, or um, reading on the, the computer in their classrooms. We've just taken all of that and moved that to that home time so that the time in the school can really be focused on that face-to-face -face instruction with the teacher and some of those more uh, independent activities that they can do on the computer. That's the extension that will be happening at home. Thank you. Uh, this is another great question for uh, one or maybe all of the principals. Will students like first graders and kindergartners who love to share things, we know, right? Uh, will they be sharing things like pencils and crayons and items that are placed in the middle of tables, manipulative items that we use for math lessons and things like that? 
our um, teachers are becoming really creative about how to still teach our students about sharing. It's important. We're all humans. We're going to teach them to get along and be kind to each other. Um, but right now we're focusing on how can we get their individual student bag of, of school supplies. They need their own pencil and crayons. And normally we can't find the pink crayon and we're going to ask our friend. Our teachers are most likely going to have a system in their classroom where they have a sanitized bin of other colors that could be chosen from to help fill that, that gap. Um, we're also going to think carefully about how we're sharing any resources or materials to make sure that if we need to use a set of blocks with the morning group and then again with the afternoon group, we're going to be careful to include that in our cleansing and sanitizing procedures. Or we're going to, our teachers are amazingly creative and they are coming up with different ways to use one set of materials for one group and one for another so that we can continue to follow all the CDC guidelines and keep everybody as safe as possible. Anybody else have more to add on that one? No, just I think to add that as Jen described that and then each the things that will be commonly used, each kid will have an individual pack for themselves. So um, many of our families experience, they got sent home with some stuff um, in the beginning of the year. I know a lot of you have used all of that stuff up, but those things, maybe if a pair of scissors or something like that got sent home, we are going to ask for that to get brought back. We'll supplement it with some more stuff as they come back and then individual packs of those things that they commonly use um, pencils, um, pen, or maybe a pencil sharpener. Some of those things will be kept with, with the students at their desk as well. Thanks. Uh, face masks and face shields. Is the school, are we requiring that they wear face masks, Sandra, or can they use a plastic shield if that's, is, is that a choice that a student or family can make? Yeah, the CDC and our local Department of Health um, uh, requires a face mask. Um, if there is an alternate face covering that the child would like to wear or the family would like their child to wear, um, there is a waiver process that we can walk the parent through where their medical provider would sign off and we would submit that to the local Department of Health for approval. Um, but until then, until we get a waiver approval, a cloth face uh, mask covering is required. Thank you. Uh, I know Rodrigo, our director of technology, isn't in the Zoom meeting, but I know he is in the room. Uh, maybe he could jump on a computer or help with the answer for this. What's the protocol going to be for Chromebooks that are going back and forth to school every day? Are we going to be providing covers or do they have covers or what's the plan there? Uh, so currently we are working on covers for um, K through three uh, students. Um, I believe the plan is, is that uh, we are wiring a cart for K through three um, uh, elementary students that they will be um, using in the, in the classroom. So we are, um, we are having students uh, K through three leave their Chromebooks at home and there'll be Chromebooks here on site for them to use. Great, thank you. Uh, lots of questions coming in still. Uh, School-related events, principals, Dr. Hurst, uh, anybody else that has information, will we still be having school-related events, um, after-school PTO events, uh, concerts, recitals, things like that, or are those kind of out of the question right now? We had talked about um, from this point forward to things um, get better that we will not have any concerts or assemblies or anything of that nature. Not sure as far as if the question is PTO, PTA events. Um, I'm not sure if we really have discussed that. So I'll let the principal jump in on that one. I would just say that um, with a lot of those events, while because of health concerns, we have to discontinue them. We are working really hard to be creative um, and do them in a safe manner. So I know, for example, our staff at Hiawatha are working on a, a virtual um, awards assembly um, to kind of model after the previous awards assemblies that we've had. So um, students will be seeing that um, soon on, on their Google Classroom feeds. Um, and then I know our, for example, Hiawatha, our PTO is, is continuing to function and meet. Um, they're just doing so remotely. Um, so you can look at their Facebook page and follow them there and, and get updates on those meetings as well. Thank you. Uh, Pete, is it possible for a child who lives outside of city limits that would normally be in the afternoon session 
to uh, attend the morning session instead if they don't require transportation. It is possible, but it will require some additional steps on, on the part of the family. We have a, a process already in place in our district for uh, students who are request, requesting placement at a, a, an alternate school uh, than what their uh, physical boundary or address would indicate. We're going to use uh, the very same process. It requires a, a conversation with the building administrator. Then uh, uh, there's a form that you'll have to fill out and would send to the central office. And the determination will really be, do we have a square footage where we could make this accommodation? What's the rationale for making the accommodation? Because we understand that we, we may not be able to accommodate everyone. But it would be uh, the same process that a family would use to request placement at an alternate school. Uh, I believe the procedure is 3131 for our for our principals to look at. Uh, but certainly you would just communicate with your, your building administrators. Uh, they'll get you that request form, transfer request form. Typically it's used to transfer buildings or transfer schools. And we're saying it's the same thing because you're, you want to go from the AM school to the PM school. So we're going to stick with our, our streamlined process that we've used for years. Okay, I'm gonna send this one to Marion and Marion, you're gonna to have to, to work with me here because I'm, I'm new here. So I, I'm gonna play that card. So I'm not quite sure what this one's referring to, but will there be a shuttle bus this year for kids who live in town? Yes, there will be. Um, we will have actually all the routes posted on our website, hopefully on October 26th. Um, and the shuttle bus schedule will be on there as well for the morning group. Great, thank you. Lots of great questions coming in on Facebook. Uh, thank you. And, and this will help uh, make our website better too, because we'll take these questions and we'll put them in the Q&A section on our website. So everybody in the community can benefit from um, the questions you're asking now. Uh, are both teachers and paras going to be working in buildings? Uh, Sandra? Yes, um, our teachers will, our K-3 teachers will be working in the buildings on November 4th, as well as our paras. Um, and so we'll phase in our staff as those grades are phased in. Uh, Pete or Sandra, uh, what is the plan when somebody in a classroom or a cohort group tests positive for COVID, how fast will other affected or potentially affected families be notified? And what's the process for that? Yeah, we're, we work pretty quickly. We've had our um, SPED students um, on site, so we're familiar with the process. Uh, we've been working closely with our local Department of Health, who's provided great guidance. Um, when we have a quick notification process, as soon as we have been told of a COVID positive case in the classroom, we will send home notifications that same day um, that there is a COVID positive in the classroom. The general notification is that um, there, will, uh, there is no quarantine um, of any other students unless those students have been identified as a close contact. Uh, so we work with our local Department of Health and with the family members that have tested positive um, to determine if there has been a close contact. Um, and if there has been, then we will send home uh, appropriate notifications. We will call parents and um, ensure that those notifications are done uh, rapidly. Thank you. Uh, question about HICAP. Is HICAP going to be allowed to attend class? I actually spoke with uh, Heidi Wagner, our director that oversees HICAP about that earlier. That's a question that came in through our website form earlier as well. Uh, still working out some details on that. We're gonna share more information probably early next week about uh, how things are gonna work for HICAP students. I think right now we have reached the end of the, the questions that have come in through the Facebook page. Wait a minute, we just had one pop up. How will we know if there was a close contact in a classroom? Uh, Sandra? Yeah, um, if there is a close contact in the classroom, like I said, we, um, we do have notification letters that will get sent out or we will um, make phone calls home to parents immediately. Okay. Uh, families that don't have access to the website or Facebook, how are they getting all this information? That sounds like a great communications question. Uh, we will be sending this information home um, in multiple ways. So this forum online, uh, the website, the Facebook page, they're not our only sources of communication, our only ways we communicate with families. Uh, so we have email, we have texting, we have good old fashioned uh, USPS postal mail. We'll be sending lots of things out, lots of ways to make sure families have the information they need. So 
so. Um, if a child that goes to school in the morning session and the babysitter is outside of city limits, will be, there be transportation available for that student? So if they're a morning student, but their babysitter or daycare or childcare is outside of city limits, uh, is there transportation available to them, Marion? That's a good question. Um, I think that we would need to have them register for transportation and um, we could probably work something out to have those kids taken to where they need to go if it's outside of city limits. Okay. Uh, Jen Perez, this uh, looks like a great question for you. What is a dual, what is a dual language kids day and homework going to look like? That is a great question for us. Um, we have been continuing our dual language model, even in our online platform, and we will continue to do that um, when we return to school. So our dual language students are used to having um, their English teacher on Monday, for example, and then the next day they would go to their Spanish teacher on Tuesday, then their English teacher on Wednesday, their Spanish teacher on Thursday, and so forth. Um, so their 50-50 model, instead of being within the same school day, normally we have English half the day, Spanish the other half, it will be an every other day model, similar to how they've had it online. Um, what's um, online at home homework for our dual language school, there are not many of our digital platforms that come in Spanish, but we do have Imagine Learning Espanol. And our teachers also use different programs such as WonderWorks and Freckle. And so they do assign Spanish homework um, through our online platforms and their Google Classrooms as well. So that's how we plan to continue on with our dual language program. Thank you. Uh, will there be a meeting like this for fourth through sixth grade? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we intend to do forums like this for each time we bring a grade level back. Uh, so far, I think it's working out pretty well. Lots of great questions. And so that is part of the plan. Uh, is staying online an option and will they still have contact with their teacher? Pete, we talked about this one a little bit earlier. Could you give a little more information about what kind of contact do we know yet um, that a student who stays online in the learning management system will have with a teacher? Sure. Uh, so we wanna reiterate that staying online is an option. Uh, but as I indicated earlier, we're, move, we're moving towards a, a, a much more self-directed experience for our students. Uh, we want to be really clear with our families that they should not expect that the live synchronous Zoom sessions that have been occurring uh, would, would, would continue moving forward, uh, particularly as we open up uh, more of our campuses. Um, as, we, as we move through the phases, it's really going to require all hands on deck at the school site. So we want to create as, as uh, rigorous and robust an experience as we can online for our families, but they should understand that there would be limited contact. Uh, we, we certainly uh, uh, understand our responsibility in providing content, providing instruction in the core areas, providing access to our resources and all of our expertise, um, but the experience will feel different. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hurst, maybe you have some insight for this question. A family that has two students, is it possible for them to have one of their students return to the blended learning model and one stay fully online in the learning management system? I'm gonna let uh, Pete answer that question. Yeah, so if, if, there, if you had a kinder student and a third grade student, could you make that choice? Is that the question, Ed? That's what it sounds like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely that could be an option for families if they decide that it works better for one child and not the other. Uh, that certainly they're going to have to manage both those platforms and it creates some additional for, uh, concerns for families or factors that they will have to deal with. But we could certainly make uh, that accommodation our, our, on our end. Can I just put the plug out, um, since we've asked this question twice in a row, that all the elementary schools just today sent out via talking points, I believe, um, the form that fam families need to do if they are going to opt their child out. So um, that information is really helpful for us in planning. So um, if you receive that form and you are planning to opt your child out, um, getting us that information as soon as possible is, is really, really helpful. And if you did not receive it for some reason, anybody listening, just reach out and we can, we can make sure we can get you access to that. Thanks. Uh, one of our principals, uh, maybe take on this one, will there be PE still, and how will that work? Yes, there will be PE still. Um, we'll have all of our specials. 
Um, we just need to, like we said many times, it's just going to look a little bit different. Uh, students are going to be uh, asked to wear their masks during PE and then also being really thoughtful about um, the activities that, that they do in PE and if there are materials, if there are, if there's PE equipment that's being used that we're ensuring that it's, um, you know, single student use and not being shared and then that it is sanitized uh, before the next group of students uses it. So, uh, yes, we are Still going to, going to have PE, but just really thinking about those um, precautions and that we need to take in order to make it as safe as possible for our students. Thank you. Sandra and Pete, this uh, kind of sounds like it's a staff question. So staff who have students who attend schools, will uh, they'll be attending the, the PM session. Will those students have transportation? I'm sorry, let me read the question uh, verbatim here. Will staff students have transportation since parents will be at work helping clean between the morning and afternoon sessions? Um, our transportation is going to be operating, um, well, in the morning they will be um, ensuring that we have meals at our distribution centers. And so transportation is limited um, for morning, um, but we will have PM transportation. So um, transportation is very limited in the morning um, and that's because we're still ensuring that meals are being um, distributed to um, the community and the students that um, are not coming um, on site on our traditional model. Thank you. Pete, uh, siblings who go to the same school, can they go to school at the same time? I think since it's geography based, yes, but is, uh, if there's something else to add to that, do you have more? I don't, they would certainly uh, attend school at the same time, yes. Okay, it is seven o'clock. We had originally planned for this meeting to last for one hour and we have just reached the end of the questions that have come in so far on our Facebook page. Um, I wanna give uh, Dr. Hurst and maybe our board president Garza an opportunity to share any final thoughts before we wrap up. Now, I, I absolutely wanna take the time to thank everyone who tuned in tonight. Uh, totally appreciate that your questions, your concerns, the feedback. Um, I think I speak on behalf of the entire board. Um, we're listening. We're, we're, we're going to perfect this. Will there be a snafu here and there? Perhaps, but uh, everything that's going to be happening uh, will have safety at the forefront. Uh, I know Dr. Hurst is probably tired of me uh, calling him or telling him, hey, uh, this, that. And, and a lot of it does pertain to, uh, pertain to safety. I think that'll be a big focus, but I think in the end, uh, getting our kiddos back, even though it won't be full time, uh, we'll begin. Uh, I don't know what to even call it. The the process of getting back to to the, some normalcy, uh, hopefully making up some some lost time where we, they perhaps academically need to catch up. And I think our staff is 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 gung ho. I think they're ready. I think they're uh, they want to see their kids back. So no, I just want to thank everyone. And like you said a while ago, uh, Ed. Uh, we will have this uh, same forum as, as, as different um, grades go back. Uh, Q&A, like you said, uh, fre frequently asked questions perhaps on the Facebook page that we could answer without a, a forum like this. Definitely uh, whoever you know, has the answer can get back to them, whether it's yourself or a principal, uh, Pete, Chris, whoever it is. But no, I just really, I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank every member of the community. Uh, our numbers are looking great let's let's continue to do the things that are within our control to to make sure that those numbers get way down uh to where they're even below the 75 per hundred thousand rate that uh the state has kind of imposed as a as a guideline uh thank you uh pete chris everybody all the all the principals administrators vice everybody involved in doing what we're doing right now thank you very much we appreciate it and in othello again community we're resilient we want our kids back. Let's continue to do the things that we can to, to ensure that we do it. And we're going to do it in a safe way. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Hershey. Um, yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for, for being here representing the board of directors. Uh, I think I would just share, uh, well, echo your words, Mike, but also share that um, this has certainly been a, a journey for uh, the district and the workers in the district. So 
I like to take the opportunity to tip my hat off to the leaders uh, who's actually um, really leading all of this work. And we know that we all understand that it's best for our kids to be back in the classroom in person. We've heard that from a number of different people. And I think we all realize that as well. I think you also heard the conversation about making sure that it's safe for our kids and adults to be back in uh, the school environment. And I just wanna share that our leaders um, have been working very hard and not just our leaders, but also our teachers and our staff. So I really wanna echo what you said, uh, Mike, um, just tipping our hats off to everyone who's been working behind the scenes to make this transition or this re-entry plan work uh, for the betterment of our students. So thank you very much. And thanks, Ed, for um, putting on this forum um, and getting the word out also to all the families and being able to do this also for other uh, grade levels that's gonna be coming on later on. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And thanks to, thanks to everybody in the community, all our parents and staff, uh, and even I think a few students who submitted questions. Uh, it was really great participation for our first time using this kind of venue for this kind of uh, form, forum. Uh, looking forward to doing it again when we bring our fourth through sixth grade students back and we will wrap it up for tonight. Make sure to check our website though frequently, otheloschools.org if you have good internet access. There's lots of questions being posted there and answers uh, quite frequently, video updates, news updates and things like that. So have a great night.